Hey everyone, today's guest is on a mission to make developers be more productive. Starting out on his academic journey, he joined the workforce and then decided to start his own company to really streamline the code review process. Marcelo Sousa. Don't forget to like and subscribe when you're on YouTube or follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Enjoy the episode. Beyond Coding. Welcome to Beyond Coding, a dive into the world of successful people in IT. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders. Here's your host, Patrick Akil. Hey, Marcelo, how's it going? Hi, doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm good, man. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You're uh, you're based in Portugal, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we've already been uh, been chatting a bit before the show, so I actually knew that. But uh, I invited you on to talk about making developers more productive, because uh, that's mainly what you've been doing now, uh, or what you are doing now. Uh, but you have a very much academic background, uh, so can you tell a little bit about um, how you transitioned from kind of an academic background um, and even joining the workforce? As you've done. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so basically, I'm kind of on a mission, on a personal mission to uh, to make you know, or to help developers be as productive as they can, right? Yeah. And this is really a personal mission to just try to give as much time to people, uh, much free time as possibly. Uh, so if they can do, you know, other things with their time that they cannot do right now because they are just doing a very mundane task, and yeah. coding is sometimes very you know, hard and, you know, it's hard <laughs> communication with all kinds of, of, uh, of structures, you know, you're communicating with a machine, which is something very strict. You're communicating with your peers, which may not right now are not even on your the same room as you are. You're communicating with the people that are, uh, you know, don't have the same background as you, right? So not technical people, yeah. either clients or, you know, CTOs or, you know, managers, lawyers. So uh, it's it's hard to be a developer nowadays, and you know from from early on, I, I when I was coding, it was really exciting, and uh, I wanted to you know started thinking about you know what, what's what's the coolest thing about coding, and it was yeah. just like you think about programs, and this you have these kind of high level specifications of programs, and then you want to kind of you know quickly get something working. Yeah, that was the thing to me, and beautifully it was just working you know all the time. And so I got into functional programming early on in my, you know, in my studies. Yeah. And uh, and then it was just, you know, from I think functional programming, you start thinking about, you know, programming language design, you know, well, what programming language should be, and then you could start working with compilers, and then from compilers you quickly go into, you know, correctness and you know just what, how software should be and and uh, or could be or what's good quality. Yeah, and then it's all about just making developers more productive because you know if they can code with fewer errors, then you know obviously they'll have more time to you know do other things with their with that with that time. Yeah, and so I started just really kind of going this narrow path of just going quite deep in terms of you know how can we actually take a program and automatically derive some properties of that program, whether that is like correctness properties, whether it's just like maintainability properties, what you, it's kind of you know, things like readability. Yeah. And, and then, you know, when you're in academia, you start thinking about, you know, impact, you know, you, you are writing these research papers yeah. and then you start realizing, okay, there are people reading these papers, hopefully uh, people, <laughs> you know, you already kind of understand that no one is very few people are going to read your PhD thesis, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, it's, papers are really kind of the, the work. And then you start thinking about impact. <laughs> and for me, I felt that the, the highest impact I could I could do was really kind of you know try to join the workforce you know just go and yeah. solve real practical problems because you know I was you know taking these very small programs and then say okay how, what can I derive what kind of things can I learn from these small programs and then you start wondering are these are these programs realistic is this really what people are coding out there yeah so for me it was just part of the learning to go to you know to the real world and see you know what 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 are the problems that actually make sense yeah uh, to solve. So really just and, to in, increase your impact on, on that front. Yeah, it was just, you know, basically understand better, you know, what are the real problems people are having? Yeah. You know, I think it's very easy when you're in a university to to not to just, you know, focus on very theoretical problems or problems that, you know, people are not really, you know, experiencing on a daily basis. And, yeah. and for me, it was more like a learning experience to just go out and, and, and understand, okay, what are the real problems companies are having and, you know, developers in these companies are having. 
Yeah, that's that's what I was wondering, especially based on what you said. How much, it, let's say you're still in that academic journey, how much of it is, is very theoretical uh, and, and more practical on that front? I have no clue. I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it depends a little bit what area you're doing. I yeah. think, you know, if you're doing like mainstream software engineering, then you're trying to have a lot of contact with companies. So it's all about kind of getting use cases from, you know, I guess usually large companies. Yeah. Because that's the other thing, you know, you when you are in this kind of academic environment, not every company can actually, you know, have the resources to go and partner with a university or with a research group. You know, yeah. this, you know, eighty percent or ninety percent of the companies don't have the resources to simply say, yeah, I'm going to partner with, uh, you know, a group in in Amsterdam or a group in Zurich or a group in, in you know in the US in whatever university, and so you you start solving problems, you know, as academics, problems that are very specific to large organizations. You know, yeah. you go to Google and then you solve a problem that is very specific to the Google code base, for example, or you go to Facebook and the same story and Twitter and so on. And there's a lot of impact on, on solving those problems. You know, those companies are really, you know, pushing for new programming languages, new technologies, new yeah. frameworks. Uh, but, you know, when you think about, you know, the code, the universe of code and, uh, and, and you, you just consider, you know, what, you know, the percentage of companies that you can actually access very quickly through yeah. academia, I think the percentage is a little bit, you know, uh, you know, smaller than people actually realize. So, you either are solving these kind of practical problems for these big companies, or you're pretty much solving, you know, things that you think are relevant, or you know, open problems in, you know, just algorithmics, or you know, just trying to make certain techniques more efficient because they can scale to things like, you know, the Linux kernel. I, I remember that, you know, for for me, there was. You know, just analyzing the Linux kernel, for example, was yeah. the thing, you know, like uh, I was doing kind of, you know, memory uh, operations analysis. So trying to understand if these, you know, compare and swaps were, were done correctly at the, at the kernel level. And, yeah. and I remember, you know, just taking this huge code base and, and just analyzing it within like, I don't know, three hours was already kind of a huge achievement. And yeah. uh, so that, that was really kind of the, the problems that I was facing because you have to go and grab, you know, w what is the code out there? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the I think the the most amount of code is not going to come from those huge companies, right? That's kind of a niche, uh, as well as the the more theoretical problems that you're solving when you are on an academic journey, um, might be hard to put to practice, right? And I don't think ninety five percent of um, of the people that are in tech are ever going to face that, right? It's it's a very small niche. Yeah, it's interesting because we, as an industry, we also kind of use these big companies as curators, right? Yeah. I mean, we, you know, I remember now we're doing a lot of code reviews now, our products about code reviews and people are always asking, you know, like how are code reviews done at Google or how yeah. code reviews are done at company X, Y, or Z. And, and those kinds of organizations are not really the kind of organization that you have, right? So it's kind of, it doesn't make much sense to even compare, you know, or even sometimes use them as your guideline because yeah. you, you cannot afford to do that. You cannot afford to spend maybe, you know, three weeks to, to review some piece of code because yeah. you don't have the resources to do so. And yeah. I find that to be quite interesting that we still have uh, as an industry, this kind of, um, you know, we are very much influenced um, on certain platforms by, you know, certain people or certain, um, yeah, organizations so, so heavily. Yeah, I, I don't know why that is, because you're right, right? If you have an organization that's kind of even a startup scale up or, or kind of mid growth wise, uh, you can't look at the, the biggest, baddest kid on the block and be like, oh, what are they doing? Uh, because you probably need to have kind of the same resources. You need to look at your own level and see, OK, what are my competitors doing? Probably better than what I'm doing. And I think that's how you can best learn for the situation that you're in. But yeah, still somehow we look at the biggest companies out there and we're like, huh, what are they doing? We must, we must adopt that to also get to that level, which is not, not scalable. Exactly. I agree. I think it's really like, uh, in a way, a fragmentation problem, right? Yeah. I mean, we, there's so much information nowadays, so many platforms, so many programming languages, so many technologies you can choose to build software that you quickly be like, you're like, I'm overwhelmed. Exactly. Like, I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And, uh, and then you're just like, I need some guidance. And then you just go and see, okay, who is going to give me this guidance? And typically these are the loudest voices are kind of the baddest yeah. that has kid in the block, right? That's why you, you start hearing to those people and you're saying, okay, I'm going to invest on this. And then the, I think one thing that is actually quite powerful is market value. You know, like yeah. if you think about, you know, 
learning a new technology, you want to understand, you know, what's the what's the coolest thing that I can learn? What what's going to be the next big thing? And I think we as developers, as you know, software engineers, we are somewhat primed to always be thinking like. I want to be on the on the edge, you know. I, I want to be an early adopter of the next big thing. Yeah. And so we are always trying out new things, and then we are always in search of this. You know, we want to be there uh, when the next wave shows up. Um, and you know, unfortunately, because of the resources, these revolutions are really kind of somewhat, you know, helped by by big big companies. Yeah, I think it's a it's a good thing and a bad thing, right? Because they have those resources, they can they can adopt and experiment more. Uh, and they are probably then also most vocal about it, right? Because they are trailblazing. Uh, they want to educate the people that come behind, which means that when you're researching, you're going to find those articles. Uh, and then you're going to be like, well, maybe we should try this. Um, and probably in a small scale on kind of an experimentation phase, uh, it's good because then you can see if what they've learned, you can also learn and apply uh, or take with you and apply. Uh, but if it doesn't work, then it's on to the next thing, right? It, it it's not scalable maybe, or it's not for your situation. Uh, so don't hold on to that just because bigger companies are doing it, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, back to you and, and kind of your transition then from, from academic journey uh, to the workforce. What, what was the first thing you did when, when joining the workforce? What was your, maybe your role even? Because you, yeah, you have so, a very specific background. I wonder what you did. Yeah. So, um, so when I finished my PhD, essentially I, I had two choices, either I would go do a postdoc and continue, or I would join a company. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough by coincidence that there was this company called uh, Sonar Source, uh, yeah. and uh, they produce, you know, Sonar Cube, uh, so tools to help uh, tackle the code quality problem. And that was very much aligned with my background. And uh, it was just a good fit uh, to, to join them and to like, you know, be a sort of a scientist role or kind of a this applied academic yeah uh, in in the company and so that's that was what i was doing also you know in my internships during during my phd you know just building analyzers uh, yeah. for practical problems and that's pretty much what i started doing you know just went and we're like okay we need the security analyzer let's build one nice and uh, just just get get to get you know to the trenches and just start building something and uh, and start taking, experimenting so i was really uh, satisfying to, to do that so so quickly after after the phd yeah that makes sense. I mean, I've, I've dabbled in kind of code quality analyzers, uh, but I have no clue where to start, right? I just research something that's online and I'm like, oh, this might work. And I'm trying to add it on my own repository. Uh, but I'm guessing you had more of the, the theoretical background to actually put that into practice, which makes it pretty cool, right? Because then what you're building can actually be applied and effective as well in that way. Yeah, it, for sure. I think that there's a lot of interesting problems in this space. Um, yeah. As academics, one thing that we don't realize is just you know how important it is to be integrated in the developer workflow. Yeah. And so sometimes you know we were just give me code and I'll give you I don't know properties. I'll give you information <laughs> about this code. Like yeah. it's it's wrong in line five hundred exactly. of this file, and then you you know you start putting that into a product. You know like that's the technology, that's an algorithm, right? And then you if you want to build a product out of that, there is so many more things you need to put into this. You know yeah. you need to kind of tell why it's wrong, you know, tell, you know, what, how, what likelihood that you, that you actually, the, the analyzer believe it's wrong because yeah. these things are not, you know, certain. It's not like, it's a, especially if you are building a static analyzer, you don't, you cannot really run the program. You're just, you know, taking the syntax and trying to derive some, some, you know, meaning out of this, of this code and, and, and understand if it's, if it makes sense. Exactly. So, you know, this developer, the integration with the developer workflow and how much you can get away with, you know, not having the best analyzer in terms of, you know, the depthness of it. Yeah. Uh, but it can be still very, very useful to developers out there. That was kind of shocking to me. You know, I, I was, I was always thinking, I know I need to, we need to go very deep and we need to do this very fancy thing. Yeah. And it turns out that sometimes, you know, the, some basic technology, some basic techniques, if it's applied correctly and if it's applied with specific use cases in mind for, you know, a large, uh, for a population of developers that uh, they have this problem. Yeah. And if it's, you know, if it works smoothly, they don't have to kind of like install and spend half an hour or one hour installing a tool. And then they have to like leave GitHub or leave their IDE to go somewhere and all these other problems that are about the product. If you nail those things down, yeah, it can go really a long way. 
And that was really interesting for me to learn, you know, like how many, you know, how this adoption of tools by developers is still, I'm still learning every day about it. <laughs> it was, it was really kind of, you know, uh, yeah, very interesting. I think, you know, just technically, uh, you know, b- when you're building a tool for an IDE versus yeah. building a tool that works with GitHub, there are very different challenges technically, right? Because in one of them, you have to be, you know, very, very fast. The latency, you know, a developer is yeah. not going to wait five seconds if it's typing a, a keyword on their IDE. Uh, but if you are waiting on GitHub, maybe you're, you can you can do that. You know, yeah. uh, you can wait five, ten seconds, one one minute, two minutes. So the the thing that people don't realize is that you cannot just apply, you know, the same technology in one versus the other. You know, these are really different beasts, and 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 so that was really that's really interesting to still do to be in that kind of a role at the moment. Yeah, yeah I can imagine that. I, uh, but I want to, I want to skip forward that the code quality and, and kind of the analyzation there is very interesting to me. Uh, but I want to get to the kind of meat and bones of what you're doing now, because you joined the workforce and at some point I'm just filling this in for you. Uh, but you were like, I'm going to start my own company, right? I found this thing uh, and I want to, I want to put my full focus in that. Um, why, why that decision, right? Why didn't you just keep trucking along in the workforce? Uh, and I say that. Maybe it sounds negative, but it's not negative because that's what I'm doing. But not everyone starts their own company, right? What was that step like for you? Um, well, it's a, I think it's a, I think you can be working in a company mm. and be like a founder. Right? Yeah. So sometimes you are, you know, especially in depends what kind of you know company you are working with. Yeah. But some people have the liberty almost of being, you know, co-founders in, in like, you know, having their own startup within another company. Yeah. And and so I agree with you that, you know, just because you are employed uh, and you're not an employer in a way, you're not a co-founder, yeah. you, uh, it's not a bad thing. For me, I think I was building a code quality tool yeah. and I was doing a lot of code reviews and I was really frustrated the way I was doing my own code reviews. So yeah. I really felt the pain on a daily basis for, you know, months yeah. to a point where I was like, you know, I, I have to try and solve this problem on my own. So that was kind of the driver for, for me personally to say, yeah. yeah, I feel that code reviews are going to be the next, one of the next big problems that we'll face as an industry yeah. because, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of, you know, ways of generating code, you know, you can either go to find the open source project that does what you want to do and just like import this dependency, which is kind of the same way as saying some AI generated this code and I'm just going to use it. That's the way I see it. Or you can actually have some AI generating code for you. And so for me, the next, you know, big problem is really kind of how do I understand someone else's code uh, when this one, someone else is me from six months ago, right? Because this is what happens to us as developers. We forget about things. We don't yeah. have really a good understanding. So for me, it was really kind of this need to solve this problem. Yeah. And I felt that at a time, the best way of doing that was just to, to kind of start fresh and start from, from with, with a new team in a new setting yeah. and with some, some different constraints. And also I wanted to learn, you know, I wanted to learn how it is to actually, you know, set up a company, to, to set up a, you know, start a team, from yeah. scratch to to sell something you know like, <laughs> yeah. as engineers it's 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 very interesting because you are not used to selling you know you're used to building and then someone else sells the thing you have built right yeah so we we receive specifications and then we just build these things based on the specifications but if you really want to uh, to build something you need to come up with a specification so you have to kind of uh, you know, try to find, you know, who are the clients, who are the users and, and then just kind of this developer adoption problem. I think it's really interesting, you know, just understanding the psychology of, you know, how developers adopt tools and why they do that. So that was yeah. also quite interesting. So it was like a mixture of things also, you know, obviously opportunities that uh, don't show up every, every day. Uh, so it wasn't like, you know, <laughs> I, you know, three years ago or four years ago, I, I wasn't thinking about starting my own company. It wasn't yeah. like my my dream or my life long life goal to say I'm going to I want to be an entrepreneur or something like that I don't really consider myself an entrepreneur yeah. uh, as of yet so uh, <laughs> it just just kind of happened exactly but I love I love hearing that right because I think everyone faces some kind of frustration in their life right but to take that step and to be like I'm going to solve this because uh, I don't want other people to be as frustrated or even to to notice it's there right? I just want to completely abstract it away uh, and solve this problem um, I love, I love that you're taking that step and, and trying to solve those problems, right? Um, and I think the developer group is very niche in that aspect, uh, but we'll get to that later. 
we we talked to Dra- Dragon on this show, and I think you've you've seen that episode as well. Uh, and I'm yeah. very fond of kind of the co-creation patterns he laid out in uh, in pair programming and, and mob programming. Um, what are some of the problems you mainly saw in kind of the code reviewing process, if I uh, were to call it that way? Um, I think, th- yeah, I, I saw a little bit of the show. I yeah. think it was was great. Um, I think the code review problem is changing a lot. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 a very complex problem in a way. So there's the on one hand you have the code understanding problem, mm. which is you know someone changed a piece of code and now I need to understand whether this change makes sense. And yeah. this basically means a lot of things. It can be like this change is you know the code co- uh, format is according to the standards of our company. I can read it. Uh, it makes sense because it's doing you know the correct you know it's not crashing the, there's a unit test for it yeah. and then you can go deeper and understand okay does this code actually fits in with the overall architecture or is something going wrong here right so there is different levels of correctness around yeah. this code understanding and this is very hard to for a human to kind of get this right right without the help of any kind of tool yeah. especially with the size of the code bases that we have nowadays you know because it's pretty much we have these cities and someone says, I want to change the, uh, uh, I want to put a stop sign here in this yeah. street. And then you, you as a developer are supposed to be like, yeah, this is all fine. It's not going to cause any kind of traffic congestion. And you, you don't know that, right? You don't know that by just analyzing that stop sign within that street. Yeah. Because the stop sign is correct, is put in correctly. You can read stop. You can see it's red. You know, so it's all different <laughs> uh, things that are happening there. So that's, I think, the, the very, you know, challenging problem, which is just, you know, code understanding about, you know, around quality. Yeah. The second issue is really about communication, you know, like, um, and I think, how do you communicate as a developer? Is it pair programming the right way of doing it? Is it just jumping into a call? Is it, you know, um, because, you know, for me, there is kind of like short term communication in terms of I want to understand this now, and yeah. maybe jumping into a call is the best way of doing that. But if I want to reuse this for my organization or for my team, is that the best way of doing things? Isn't it better to just put a comment like a text into yeah. and say, I want to save this comment for the future because it's going to be useful for another person that joins in six months and is going to have to kind of change this code base. Yeah. So I think we don't think so much uh, about these problems. And I think this is really around code reviews and code maintainability that you, you see this kind of communication. Um, and then you obviously have communication about, you know, does it make sense to work, to organize ourselves this way? I think that, you know, this idea of pull requests is, uh, I think I agree, is kind of in a way fundamentally uh, being applied in maybe in a wrong way for yeah. a lot of companies because um, I think it started from this open source culture of, you know, I'm receiving contributions from external people. Yeah. But if I already know the people I'm working with for 10 years, why do I need to have this, you know, additional, you know, gate, additional, you know, blockage of just sending the code to, to a long lived branch. Yeah. So I think it's also about, you know, the way you communicate, you know, the way you look at this, uh, you know, code changes and the way you kind of produce code as a team. Yeah. And so I think that's where pair programming and mob programming really can make a big difference is, is about, you know, just being more agile or being faster or being more, I don't know, collective intelligence, yeah. uh, you know, more like a collective intelligence. and But that's not going to really change the problem of, you know, me as an individual, I have to understand the code. Right? Exactly. Because I have to maintain it eventually. Yeah. I, I think it's I think it's a very difficult problem. Already the things you've laid out uh, and also what Dragon laid out in his episode makes me think there's not just one way, right? I don't think there's a golden um, answer to solve this because the problem is that complex. Uh, and I think even the the way you've laid out you're not going to solve kind of the asynchronicity problem um, of checking each other. It's not even checking each other's work. Uh, I don't even want, know what to call it, basically. But you don't want to be blocking in that way, right? It's fully in line with what you said uh, in making developers be more effective, right? And we already see that this problem, for some reason, isn't necessarily working, right? Uh, you get to see kind of a street with a stop sign kind of analogy that you've laid out. Uh, but you need to understand maybe the full block or the whole city um, in and of its own to see if that stop sign there makes sense, yes or no. Uh, and we, as developers, we know a lot of the tools can actually help us with that, except we haven't really innovated on this kind of aspect uh, of our kind of work environment, right? It's a very day-to-day thing, pull requests, code reviews. I think everyone faces it, at least every developer faces it. Uh, 
Um, and it's very natural, but yet we haven't innovated at all on this front, uh, except you are kind of solving this problem. Yeah, I think that you're right. And I think there's a good reason for that. I think that we are also, we are engineers, right? We, yeah. we solve, you know, we, if there is a problem that we are facing on an everyday uh, basis, we eventually will solve it. Yeah. I think that perhaps what's happening is that we have, we are solving well, other kinds of problems right now, yeah. right? If you like DevOps, you know, like automation uh, in terms of deployments, and it, it's, it was a huge problem we, we we just tackled. You know, in terms of you know, I was having like a, a release cycle of maybe three months, and yeah. you know, just deploying this huge uh, pr product was a pain. You know, and now we are able to really kind of click a button and everything happens yeah. automatically. You know, continuous integration, continuous deployment. I think we come a long way, and. What's happening is that, you know, we are solving some problems, which is basically putting pressure on other problems. And I think, you know, obviously I am betting that uh, we are probably stressing more and more the code review problems. So the yeah. code review problem will become more and more important. And I think that's why it's interesting to have these conversations, which is, you know, okay, we have solved part of this problem. Okay, what are the next problems we're going to start facing to, to become as productive as, as we can be, you know, because... Uh, the complexity is here. We cannot change yeah. the, this. And it's really... a, a I think one thing we don't understand a lot as engineers and and even as developers is this power of exponentials. You know, we we, we understand this base too because we deal with it. But <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, co code is code is becoming the number of lines of code being added at the moment is just unbelievable. You know, like we're going to produce perhaps more code in the next five years than we produced yeah. in the last forty. And if you think about that, that's 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 huge, you know, just in terms of you know complexity of code. Yeah. So we cannot really, I think, our granularity level has to become higher than what it is right now. Exactly. It's kind of what you're saying, you know, like right now we're looking at streets or part of streets, and soon we we'll have to look at entire blocks. Yeah. And we need tools to help us do that, because otherwise it's just gonna create a huge bottlenecks into the system, and then. Uh, hoping that AI or machine learning or that no low code, no code platform is going to save us. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a little bit naive uh, to to think that, and and especially because you know more we we, we have the need of having more people, you yeah. know, becoming developers. You know, like the hiring is very hard. Absolutely. So we're kind of creating this perfect storm where you know we simply just kind of meltdown as as as, as an industry we, yeah. don't, we don't know what to do basically exactly. you know like we have all these junior people uh and uh, we don't have the best tools and uh, we we are really kind of lost in a way yeah and especially if we're already now feeling like something's wrong right we're not working as optimal as it could be uh, or we can have and, and leverage tool sets to make it better right really stream out kind of that workflow and that work process to be more effective, to be more productive, because that's eventually what is needed. Uh, so let's dive into kind of what ReviewPad is doing now and, and what it's kind of solved or, or is solving still. Yeah, so ReviewPad is trying to solve this uh, code understanding problem, right? Yeah. So one, the first thing we're trying to do is really to say, okay, how can we make sure that you as a developer, when you're reviewing code, you don't go into this mode of reverse engineering what the developer did yeah. you know, from the moment they open the branch to the moment they open the pull request. And that's one of the big things we are trying to tackle, uh, you know, just in terms of code understanding, what's the impact of line of code, you know, how can I, you know, if I have uh, an habit in my team of having large pull requests, yeah. uh, because that's just the way we work. Uh, we are not trying to change and say you need to kind of cut down the the, the pull requests. We're not trying to change habits. We are trying to make you more productive, yeah. uh, and then making you realize that over time, if you want, you can actually change your habits. Uh, because I think it's very hard to to change habits in in, in you know in, in that way. You know, just say this is the way to do it. Because as we described, this is the way to do it. It's perhaps not always applicable, right? So it's yeah. not up to a tool to say this is the right way of doing things. The best we can do is to say this is how you're working and this is what, how you can improve uh, in this or that task. And that's also about, you know, if you are a team which has large pull requests, then, you know, you probably spend a lot of time reading code. You yeah. know, or you just skim through the changes and you're entering this mode, looks good to me, right? So I, I, it just becomes very hard to, exactly. to understand this code. And so the first thing we're trying to do is also to understand those kinds of patterns, you know, like, are you are you just doing all this looks good to me uh, more often than you should, right? Yeah. So uh, how much of the code you actually understand, how much of the code have you reviewed, right? So uh, a little bit of metrics as well, because you, 
it's we don't like to measure things. We are very analytic, but uh, we we feel a bit weird sometimes when people. It is changing, by the way. But yeah. I remember like we used to consider programming as an art, right? So mm. how dare you say that uh, I, I, you know, have I, I need to measure my own productivity as a developer because yeah. I'm an artist? And I think we are changing a little bit this posture of you know saying we are artists and we are doing something subjective to to be more like yeah we are actually you know just trying to get value out of uh, software yeah and that allows us to be more productive and say okay yeah there's certain parts of it which is you know more creative but some other parts which you know a lot of jobs right now in programming uh, are not creative at all you know you're just implementing APIs and yeah. uh, you know it's like it's it's boring. Yep. It's really boring from time to time, and you're like, well, you know, why am I doing this? And you just get handsomely paid to do sometimes boring jobs. I remember, you know, ten years ago, I remember meeting people. They were getting like six hundred euros a day to to database back backups, uh, yeah. and you know, for me, it was like, this is crazy. You know, this is a lot of money. Uh, yeah. Obviously, now I have a different perspective on that, but you know, at that time, it was just a lot of money to just be doing database backups. Yeah. Uh, so we, we are changing, we are adapting, but uh, but this is a problem we are trying to solve. You know, just understanding where you are as a, as a as a developer, how productive you are in terms of you know reviewing code, yeah. and what you can improve in terms of this understanding of code to to make sure that you have the fewer bugs as possible. You know, the basic thing we are trying to measure at the moment is just what's your throughput yeah. as a as a reviewer, and what is that for us? That's you know. If I'm spending five hours to basically make a comment and this comment makes a code change, that's how much I'm investing to improve the quality of the code. Yeah. You know, because I may be putting a lot of comments in the code asking <laughs> questions, but if the ultimate thing we want uh, is to basically have the highest quality of code as possible, yeah. then the code review process should really be about, I want to, you know, make sure that I'm putting a lot of comments that are a lot of, are suggesting a lot of changes that actually improve that. and. So this is, I think that by measuring that, we kind of have an understanding of, yeah, I'm not being as efficient as I could be as a reviewer, you know, like uh, I actually need to understand bet, a bit better the code base before I start reviewing all this piece of code yeah. uh, so that I can actually say something insightful. Because when you ask someone to review your code, they also feel the need of saying something, you know, insightful, insightful about it. They want to ask questions sometimes, you know, because you're getting, you're asking for feedback and you're trying yeah. to improve. Um, but, you know, there's different nuances of, you know, how people see code reviews as well. You know, uh, some people, it's really about just communication and improving each other. Some other people, it's a bit more formal in terms of, you know, I need to get approvals on my pull requests. Yeah. So uh, one thing that uh, we are actively trying to do is to break this definition of, you know, pull requests are equal to code reviews. Yeah. Like you, you can only do code reviews if you are doing pull requests. Uh, and and that's not the case at all, right? Exactly. So we, we, we can actually have a tool where you can do code reviews, whether you're using or not pull requests. Uh, that's a different story because that's a, that's a way of, you know, just integrating changes in, in, a, in a code base. Yeah. And, and yeah, so that's, we are solving different problems uh, around this, but it's really using these techniques from, from a code quality and trying to make sure that the quality of the code is as high as possible. Yeah, it really makes sense that, I mean, your general understanding of the code uh, and that delta, right? Because code has changed, it's continuously changing. You just need to see if it's changing in the right way uh, or you need to adjust, right? You need to take the steering wheel or help someone steer in the right direction. Uh, and it, Exactly. I'm, I'm loving that you're saying it shouldn't be a pull request or it doesn't have to be a pull request because it can be continuously, right? Even in those kind of co-creation patterns, someone else is looking at me while I'm, I'm doing something, uh, they're immediately reviewing the code by means of seeing what new code is added um, even though they are involved in kind of the thought process, someone is kind of reviewing that, right? Uh, it's not just me, and therefore it is kind of a code review in that way as well. And it's immediate. Uh, but those asynchronous processes, they're still going to happen, right? You're going to have open source projects where you still want to do your code review. Right? And it doesn't always have to be in pull requests. Uh, that's why a lot of open source projects have like millions of pull requests open, basically, and don't get the time to merge them because it's, it's a lot, right? And that thing that helps you in understanding um, just the frequency and those deltas better, I think it's it's necessary, right? And I hope it's going to be review pad. It might be a different tool, but I think it is something that's going to help us kind of streamline that process because I feel like it's it's very much necessary kind of having been through that process. I mean, you've been through the same process uh, and I think a lot of people I've talked to feel kind of that same pain. 
basically. And it is a pain. It could be smoother, basically. It could be optimized. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think we need better ways of communicating about code as well. Yeah. You know, like we, we cannot expect, we already know that not all code reviews or that, you know, not every line of code we produce is great. Yeah. But I think we still like the understanding of like, I produce this piece of code yeah. and I know it's not great, but I don't have a good way of uh, flagging that this piece of code is not great yeah. and say, I need still to ship it because, you know, I, you know, different constraints, you, you cannot always build the perfect code, yeah. but, but we don't have a good way of going to a code base right now and say, this piece of code here, or this part of the code is not as great as it could be in a way. And this other part is not as great. I mean, we have ways of analyzing the code and yeah. deriving that information, but it's not really kind of you know, human based. It's not like I am actively saying I can put a to do there and yeah. fix me. A little breadcrumb. But but we we feel a bit like weird about doing it. It would be a nicer way of more, you know, nicer if we could just, I don't know, put some coloring scheme. Yeah. I don't know what kind of t- technique we would like to use, but just a way of saying, yeah, not everything has to be perfect. And sometimes you just we're gonna ship code that yeah. it's not you know, as good as it could be, but we want, we need to have a way of tracking that. We need to have a way of continuously understanding, okay, we are now reaching a level where we need to stop a little bit this kind of process and actually improve the code yeah. better and, you know, just make it more maintainable. And for me, that's a big challenge, you know, because quickly nowadays code gets to like a million lines of code yeah, uh, very, very fast. You know, you just you import a bunch of like open source libraries that you have it's just very amazing to me. Like you, you want to have like a functionality and you see that there's an open source package that has this functionality yeah. and then you, you, you kind of use it as a dependency, but you, what you don't realize is that you're importing maybe 1% or 2% of this big thing that you just imported. So now your code base just became, you know, 10 times yeah. larger than it should be. So maybe what we need is a way to say, I just want to take this piece of part of this open source and just automatically generate something that is only that part. Yeah. And so you don't actually importing code that you you're not using. So this is quite remarkable how much dead code there is on software being shipped. Exactly. Uh, at some point, I was checking some statistics about this um, in, a, in a big organization, and I was just shocked. You know, like how much code is running on our phones, yeah. or how much software is running on our phones that actually is not you know executed at all, or we don't we don't even know. So it's just space yeah. being, being stored. I mean, does it make any sense? Do you, do you know kind of a percentage in that way? Because I have a hard time kind of figuring out how much is too much in that way. Yeah, I would say it should be around to certain types of apps around yeah. 80%. 80% really? of the code. Yeah. That is insane. Right. <laughs> That's way more than I thought. Yeah. So we, we have, we are shipping a lot of code in yeah. software that, you know, it's it's just being imported for a reason, for, for just because it's been packaged that way. Yeah. And yeah, that makes sense. And that we could probably save a lot of costs in, in that way as well. But moving back to, to what you're doing more on a, on a day-to-day basis, your target audience are developers, right? And I think developers already are a kind of a, a niche and you're building a tool for developers to make them be more effective. What, what are kind of the things you've learned in building that thing for developers as target audience? So many things we've learned or we're still learning. <laughs> yeah. The first thing is that developers... <laughs> are not as niche as we think okay. in terms of it's not easy to target all developers yeah. or it's actually very hard to do that. Mm. So um, you need to start with the community. You need to start with some very specific set of developers which share like really some kind of workflow almost because, you know, the way a developer that is doing Rust thinks about code is yeah. very different than the way a developer that is doing mainly JavaScript thinks about code. And this is really about, you know, the kind of programming language that they are using, the technology they are using, the kind of products they are building. Yeah. So it's very hard to target developers as a whole. That's yeah. the first thing. When you start realizing that, then you start getting a bit scared because you think, okay, the, the market is just too fragmented. You know, there's just too many things going on and yeah. you don't know where to start. And so this is really kind of a big struggle for, for a startup is just to like when you're trying to start with you know putting a product that you believe in to developers uh, how do you start how which community do you do you go to because developers are also very busy you know they are you know they are doing their own thing they don't have so much free time yeah they are very picky from time to time you know <laughs> if it yeah. doesn't work smoothly um there's different levels of you know like 
how should I put it, rigidness, you know, mm-hmm. like some people are kind of like more forgiving. Some people are like, yeah, this, I tried it on this program. It didn't work. Yeah. You know, I move on to the next thing, you know? And so you start questioning whether you're solving some from time to time, a real need yeah. or whether you just have to wow them. So they want to be wowed for sure. You know, there must be a little bit of like a multiple wow effect, like, oh, wow, I, I didn't know this. And code reviews are actually interesting because I talked with hundreds or thousands of developers in the last two years. Yeah. And some of these conversations really started with, you know, how is your code review process going? And they're like, oh, it's going great. You know, I can go to GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket and I can see the changes. I can make comments yeah. and it works fine. And I was like, okay. Uh, <laughs> and then I start showing them review path and then they start like opening up to like, oh, wow, I didn't know this was possible. You know, yeah. I didn't know I could just get this information uh, on, on the, on the, or they start they seem comfortable to some extent with the current process because perhaps they are solving different problems on a day to day and yeah. code reviews is actually not like a first class citizen in their yeah. work, which is, I think another problem we have to solve, which is like considering code reviews as actual work that people are doing. You know, if I'm taking four hours to do a code review, this should be counted as, you know, productive work yeah. that I'm doing. I'm helping out, you know, the, 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 it's as, as important as I'm producing the code. Absolutely. And I think that we have not evolved, uh, you know, in kind of like the mainstream to really understand that that's the case. Um, part of it is because of this pull request, short, like small pull request movement, which is like, yeah, you should be very, very fast. You shouldn't block people with, with uh, your reviews and so on. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, it's it's tough. Developers are not the, the, a very easy market to, to go to. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's very fun, you know, because you, first of all, we can dog food. So we are developers ourselves. Yeah. So we can also try to understand. So I'm just like to learn, you know, how they think, you know, how, what kind of problems they, they care about. But, uh, but it's definitely, I think a little bit fragmented at the moment, you know, like you, you have to really imagine. pick your battles and, you know, just go for the people that have the, the problems that you're trying to solve because not everyone is going to have that. Sometimes people just have different ways of organizing themselves yeah. and, and different concerns as well. I really, I really like that insight because as you've laid it out, you're, it completely makes sense to me, right? Focus in either a language or kind of a target audience within that developer group because the developers are, I mean, it's a big audience, I guess. Uh, but some people are going to feel that pain more often than not, right? And the only way to do that is to have actual conversations with them uh, and see if that awareness is there, right? If it's not there, then you can wow them. I love that you're using those, uh, those wow factors. And they're probably going to be more aware of the problems they're having day to day. Uh, but for the people that already know that there's a problem, right, but don't necessarily know where the solution lies or just dealing with it or have accepted it, um, there's where you can shine because then they already recognize the problem. You don't have to necessarily lay it out for them uh, as you would maybe for a lot of other, other developers. Uh, and then you can really just brainstorm on the solution, right? Because you also probably have an idea of a solution. But it needs to be verified, right? Developers have to accept it at some point uh, and make use of it on their own. Yeah, for sure. I think that's super important. You need to really like iterate as fast as possible with yeah. with, uh, with the users, right? And and understand, okay, is this the right solution for them? Yeah. I think that when it comes to code reviews in particular, we are still ex- very much in experimentation phase. Yeah. You know, uh, there's a lot of people talking about just better ways of communication, right? So you know, like pair pair reviews uh, yeah. or you know mo- mob reviews, and so you see a lot of you know people advocating for those type type of techniques. And then you have people that advocate for like a synchronous, you know, like I, I want to be, you know, I'm in New Zealand and someone else is in, in Germany. And, yeah. you know, I, I cannot just wake up at 3 a.m. to do a, a pair review. So I need to have a way to communicate what, what kind of tool is, is best to, to this kind of uh, reviews. Yeah. So I, I think it's, again, you have to iterate with the people. You have to go and say, okay, what are the, the 10, you know, uh, 10 companies, 10 teams, 100 developers that are really kind of in need for this kind of tooling right now. Yeah. And and hopefully there's going to be a pattern there where you can start creating kind of a business out of it, right? Because, you know, that's the other thing. As a, as a startup, uh, you, you have to kind of, you know, try to reach product market fit as fast as possible. You yeah. have to try to, to keep growing. And that's not a concern you have when you're doing something for a big organization, uh, exactly. because then your cl- your clients are the teams within the organization. Yeah. That's also the I think you know going back to your previous question, one of the things that I actually like by having this sort of independence is that I don't have to like solve internal problems this yeah. way. Like, um, sure, if I work for a big company and I'm solving these problems, I'll have clients guaranteed. You know, the the people in the that company will be my clients. Yeah. 
but then does it generalize to the public? Yeah. And, um, and that's, I think, the, the big question that uh, I always faced. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's going to generalize. So I, I just don't want to risk that. I just want to go and do something a bit more crazy and say, <laughs> let's skip this process. Exactly. Uh, and, and actually, let's go and try to, to find people in the wild to do this. And it's, it's a bit not very, I'm not sure if I recommend that, to be honest. Mm. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a path that we have taken. So it's, uh, yeah. it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, there's no golden path, right? So you're just going to try things out, see if it works. If so, good, keep going. And otherwise, just shift gears and try something else. Exactly. Uh, but moving back to kind of the organizational part, I guess, of the startup, you guys are, are fully remote, aren't you? Yeah, we are fully remote. Yeah, how's that been going so far? Because I always hear fully remote. I have no clue pros and cons. Sounds good to me, as, as especially as a developer. <laughs> but how's that been going for you guys? I think it's uh, it's interesting for us. Um, well, we are fully remote because uh, from the beginning we wanted to, and I don't like this idea that you need to move to a different city to yeah. get a job. So I, I always like this. Yeah, I always like the the freedom of saying I can live wherever I would like to be for whatever reason, yeah. personal or, or not or not personal. But I shouldn't move because I want to work with a particular team. So yeah. that's kind of the way we were set up from the beginning. The second thing was I always liked this idea that, you know, I go to bed and then someone else wakes up and continues like, you know, sort of like round the clock productivity exactly. in a way. And, uh, and because that's what you actually want to do, you know, you want to clone yourself. Uh, yeah. if, if I could, I would clone myself and I would go to bed and then Marcelo would wake up in San Francisco <laughs> and then he would continue doing what I'm doing. You know, if I can achieve that kind of collective intelligence where everything just runs smoothly, you're really kind of, you know, being as productive as you can as a sort of a small scale economy. Yeah. So I always find that appealing. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's working as expected in a way, like we have the pandemic, obviously that doesn't help because yeah. even as a startup, you want to be full remote, but you want to have some face-to-face -face contact, you know, because it's just the tooling was, is, I don't even know if the tooling is here already for, you know, fully remote startups where you need yeah. to brainstorm a lot about ideas. You need to iterate on you know solutions, you need to have you know very you know easy ways to communicate, uh, and there's something lost. You know when when I'm I'm not in the same physical room yeah. as you are, there certain things are lost. This is just a fact of life, and um, sometimes you feel the need for those things as a startup. You know just you know more social time, more you know trying to just you know decompress from and here and there uh, that you don't need if you are working in a company which is very mature. You know what you're doing. It's the process is pretty much. Like, you know, you're just kind of going with the flow. The train is already moving and you just, you know what you need to do. You don't need to go to the office. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that I think it makes a lot of sense is that with remote, we are kind of becoming much more aware of times we spent on meetings. Yeah. Uh, and so I like that, you know, with remote, you can just say, there's no meetings, you know, you just, uh, <laughs> you, you, you don't have to, you can do your own thing and exactly. you just... You can just find the best way to self-organize. Uh, so I'm, I'm reading this book called Remote Inc. Uh, okay. And uh, it's all about, uh, yeah, just how to work remotely. And they always talk about this business of one. You know, when you're working as a as a as a in a remote company, you have to think like the CEO. You have to because you need to have clients, which is your kind of like your boss or the company. Yeah. You have to have like you're the head of marketing and you're head of HR because you have to kind of become like a solo entrepreneur uh, exactly. when you are working remotely. You have to organize your time. You have to know how to establish metrics of success. So I think it's a very healthy exercise to, to do that as a startup. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, as I mentioned, communication is, is a challenge, you know, yeah. as, as an early stage startup working fully remote. But, you know, it's a question of iterating and just finding the best way. And, you know, it's you quickly you understand when you've reached plateau and you need to do something to, to start again the, <laughs> the the process of you know creativity there i can imagine that yeah there's there's one final question i still have and has has a lot to do with trust right especially when you're in a startup uh even with a, a fully remote culture uh there's going to be a lot of trust from you first of all to your employees and from your employees to join kind of this crazy startup journey um and to join the company and, and work towards that greater good right a greater goal how's that trust been are you very easy on a personal level just giving out that trust or have do they have to earn it earn it what's kind of your mantra there and what have you seen yeah we're quite lucky because you know everyone in the team 
possibly everyone is. We know each other from 15 years ago. Uh-huh. We all actually went to university together yeah. uh, back that in helps. Portugal. Uh, so there is a lot of that implicit trust in terms of, of the personal level. Yeah. Um, I personally think that more than trust is more like self-awareness. Like, mm. you know, what do I want to get out of this? You know, there must be a sense of mission. Yeah. Like you're joining a startup. There must be a mission for this startup. Absolutely. And you must believe in that mission like 100%, 200% yep. for that, right? Because it involves sacrifices. You know, when you when you join a startup, it involves sacrifices. The way I see it is really kind of as a developer, what's my market value? You know, like if I'm going to, my learning rate in a startup is, you know, 10 times, 50 times you know, higher than if I was in any company, probably that is sort of already mature. Yeah. And that's, I think, usually the way I like to see things is that, you know, I learned so much working in a startup in terms of technology, in terms of just getting things done, Yeah. that then I can go and apply these to many other settings. And if I were in this company doing this very specific technology thing, and even if I was getting a million dollars a year salary, that's great. But if I want to change... Where am I going to change exactly. to? You know? Because if, if, if this is the only company using this, yeah. I'm, I'm options kind are of limited. In, in a bad spot. Exactly. I'm in a bad spot. So for me, it's all about, you know, just if you're learning, if you're improving, if you are really kind of keeping, you know, ahead or, you know, what's the state of the art in the market, yeah. you're always going to be in a good position as an engineer, you know, exactly. because you're always going to be able to, you know, leave the startup or, you know, exit in whatever way. And you're going to be able to find, you know, a much better job that you would have if you have not joined the startup. And yeah. you're going to have fun. You know, you're going to have, you're going to enjoy, you're going to learn new things. You're going to hopefully try to make a difference and, and cause an impact and make people's lives better, right? It's, for us, that's always, you know, the, it's always have to be positive, you know, for, for the society. And that's, I think, you know, this, this spin on productivity, on quality of code, uh, these kind of hard problems, for me, it's, it's there's certain you know joy at the personal level to be able to, to work on these problems and to yep. specialize on these problems versus you know perhaps you know working in a financial institution and just see see money as a, as a means uh, to to do something else you know I, I I really like this idea that we must be doing some positive uh, change uh, right now yeah yeah I fully agree I love that you're like I mean the joy of what you're doing on a day to day level that's what you're doing it for right and I love that you found a way to do that. Uh, and to really follow that mission, right? To to help developers be more productive, um, and it can be in a in a multitude of ways. The most important one is just to pick one, learn from that, and and see if it's the right one or to shift. Thank you for coming on, Marcelo. I I love all the things that you've shared. Uh, I really Thank appreciate you. you coming on. Thank you so much for the invitation, and yeah, hope, hope you enjoy. Yeah, I I hope so too, guys. So uh, Marcelo Souza, everyone. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders. 